Good morning again. Good morning to anybody watching on Facebook Live. I hope this is working going through. For the reading this morning, I'd like to offer just a couple of selections from the book Love and Death by the late UU minister Forrest Church. Love and Death was written after Forrest Church was diagnosed with terminal esophageal cancer at the age of 59. And it contains his reflections on facing mortality. It's um, actually one of the most powerful books I've ever read on that subject. And also on how we might live a life that is truly worth dying for, his words. He writes in, it begins with a little bit of humor. Are we okay with a little bit of humor? He says, people who claim that higher knowledge will free us from suffering are fooling themselves. Don't get me wrong. It makes good sense to take care of our bodies, but to do so to the point of obsession only invites another form of pride. I have a friend who has given up alcohol, cigarettes, coffee, eggs, meat, milk, and the sun. <laughs> he eats oat bran for breakfast, rides his exercycle religiously, and never uses the microwave oven. He may not live any longer than his least prudent neighbor, but as his doctor told him, it will certainly seem longer. <laughs> Things are getting difficult, Forrest Church writes, for people who devote their lives to postponing death. Almost every day, something new is added to the list of death-abetting substances and activities. The hard truth is we all die of something. Vegetarians die, joggers die, even people with low cholesterol die, many before their time. One can do everything imaginable to play the right numbers, to change the variables of the human equation, and still, life won't check. We are born into great mystery. We die into great mystery. In between, in that little dash between the dates on our tombstone, what we know of God, we learn from love, we learn from love's lessons. Love teaches us the difference between what is holy and what is diabolical. When we act in concert with our highest selves and embrace our neighbors, we act in the presence of all that is divine. Conversely, the demonic divides us against our higher selves and from our neighbors. Whatever is born of hatred and division is not of God. The only thing that truly saves us is that which is born of love and compassion. So last Sunday, I preached on one of those old religious words that most of us probably don't think very much about. I talked about revelation last week. And this morning, I'm going to be talking about another old religious word that probably a lot of us don't think much about and perhaps doesn't make sense to some of us. This morning, I'm going to be talking about salvation. When I talk about salvation, I want to be clear that I am not talking about what will get us into heaven. I want to be clear that I am not talking about what will get us into heaven. Although I want to point out that if you show me, if you show me a person's idea of heaven, it will tell me an awful lot about what that person is like in this world. If you show me somebody who thinks heaven is limited to people who believe like they do, I'll show you a person who more than likely favors discrimination and exclusion here on earth. It's like that line from the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. And just imagine how broken you would have to be. How wrong your heart would have to be to believe in a segregated heaven. To believe in a sign on the gates of heaven that says whites only. To believe that the architect of heaven needs to construct a wall to keep the Catholics out. <laughs> on earth as it is in heaven. Historically, our universalist forebears of the 1700s and the 1800s answered this question of who gets into heaven by proclaiming universal salvation. Universal salvation. They believed that everyone got to go to heaven 
Nobody is excluded, no exceptions. Do not pass go, don't collect $200. Straight to heaven. In the last century, our Unitarian Universalist traditions thinking about the afterlife has evolved. Has evolved to a position that I call positive, pluralistic, agnostic refocusing. <laughs> that explains it all, right? Positive. We reject ideas about the afterlife that are based in hatred, fear, chauvinism, or exclusion. Pluralistic. Our tradition includes people with some diversity of ideas about the afterlife, including many people who reject the concept of the afterlife entirely. So we probably have some diversity in the room if we were going to go around and poll everybody. Pluralistic. Agnostic. Our tradition also says that the afterlife is something that it's impossible to know about with absolute certainty. And finally, refocusing. Ultimately, we insist that it is unproductive to spend a lot of time worrying about the afterlife. Religion, we think, shouldn't be about transportation to some other world. It is about how to live life most fully and meaningfully and faithfully and courageously here in this world. So when I talk about salvation, I want to be clear that I'm not talking about what will get us into heaven. I want to talk about what it means to find salvation in this world, in the here and now, not saved for some later life, but saved in the sense of living the most full-hearted life that it is possible to live here and now. I think it's fair to talk about being saved in this world, because God knows it's fair to talk about being lost in this world. The lost of the world were on display this weekend up in Charlottesville, walking around with Confederate flags and Nazi flags and guns. Lost to hatred, lost to ignorance, and most of all, lost to a lie about who they are and what they are. It's fair to talk about salvation because some are truly lost in this world. It's fair to talk about salvation because some are lost to apathy and indifference lost to greed and self-centeredness. It's fair to talk about salvation in this world because some are lost to fear, lost to hopelessness, lost to despair, too numb to care, too afraid to share in what might truly, really save us. And so I want to talk about what really, truly saves us. This past June, the keynote speaker at the Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly in New Orleans was Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is an attorney and activist, author of the best-selling book, Just Mercy. And he is an attorney in Alabama who specializes in defending people on death row, especially those who find themselves on death row due to the racism that exists in our criminal justice system. When Brian Stevenson spoke to us, he told us that in order for us to be transformed, it is necessary, he said, for us to get proximate to other people. Get proximate. He told the story of his first visit to a person on death row. He told us how he had read books and taken classes and studied cases and formed opinions, but that the experience the experience of meeting someone on death row, of forming a relationship with that person, was transformative. He said he needed to get proximate to be transformed. In order to be saved, we must make ourselves proximate with the suffering, with the oppressed, and with those that society discards. Last week on Sunday evening, I went down to Raleigh for the gathering an event hosted by William Barber in which we engage in public theology on the moral issues of the day. Last Sunday, the topic we engaged theologically was immigration and sanctuary. And our time together began with us meeting by video a man, Pastor Jose, who had been ordered deported and then was welcomed into sanctuary at a church in Durham. We met his wife and his children who were with us that evening. And here is what William Barber said later on in the evening. He said that our moral work, our moral engagement needs to be based in relationship. When you know someone, when they become your family, 
The moral stand becomes something you don't think twice about. To be saved or, be to, or to be the agents of salvation, which is really two sides of the same coin. To be saved or to be the agents of salvation, which is really two sides of the same coin, we must get proximate. Throughout the Gospels, if there's one word that can be used to describe the, the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, that word is, I think, proximate. Time and time again, Jesus tells his disciples to stand aside so that the person coming to see him can meet him. Bring that person to me, he says. Time and again, bring that person to me. And then when that person comes, Jesus gets close, gets physically close to this person, this person with a disease or this person with an injury or this person who has been ostracized. Jesus touches them, literally touches them, embraces them, whispers to them, he gets proximate. So the first thing I want to say about salvation is I want to challenge you. I want to say that our salvation comes from getting ourselves really proximate, that our salvation comes from getting close, that salvation can't happen in the abstract but only in the personal, that getting close is what saves us. On, he on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. And so if your heaven includes refugees and people in prison and immigrants and people working for a minimum wage, you might as well start by getting proximate now. If you're going to be with those people in heaven, you better start by getting proximate now. The next thing I want to say about salvation is that it doesn't make sense to talk about salvation in individualistic terms. In the United States, possibly the most individualistic nation on earth, strands of evangelical and fundamentalist and even mainline Christianity have at times treated salvation in personal and individualistic terms. Are you saved? Are you saved? Salvation is something you get for yourself. And I have to tell you, this really doesn't make sense. And this way of thinking stands outside of traditional religious thought. This idea that salvation is, is individual. I have to tell you, I once had this theological argument way, way back, a long time ago. I was in college, I had become acquainted with an evangelical Christian who was convinced that he was going to heaven and who was convinced that me, because I'm a Unitarian, that I was going to hell. And so I got to know him. And one day I was feeling really devious. And, and I told him that I was sorry that I had ruined heaven for him. What, what do you perplex to you? What do you mean? Well, I said, Mike, since, since you're my friend, and I'm your friend, since you care about me, you're not going to be able to enjoy heaven knowing that your friend is suffering in hell. Well, I said, I suppose you'd be able to enjoy heaven if you're a sociopath <laughs> who kind of enjoys other suffering. Or if heaven offers some kind of like intoxication, some kind of hallucination that, that keeps you from being aware of reality. But otherwise, heaven must really stink. What with having to know that your friend is being tormented? Sorry I ruined heaven for you. Pretty devious, right? That's because individualistic salvation does not make sense. It doesn't make sense when we talk about the afterlife because it doesn't make sense either here on earth. On earth, as it is in heaven. Martin Luther King said, in a real sense, all of life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I want to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. 
So it makes no sense to talk about salvation individualistically. If you believe that heaven is something you get as an individual, regardless of what happens to everyone else around you, then you're probably going to be satisfied with a world that's structured so that some live in luxury and others subsist, or worse, in abject poverty. You're probably going to be satisfied with a world where some have enough to eat and others are hungry. If that's your idea, if that's not your idea of heaven, don't let it be your idea of earth. Our salvation is collective, not individual. We must all get free together. This brings me to the last thing I want to say about, about salvation, about what really, truly saves us. We are saved, I believe, by engagement, by action. We're not saved by passivity or by retreat. And we're not saved by imagining ourselves as somehow above or outside of or beyond the struggle. Eli Wiesel famously said, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. And silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Or as the great Rabbi Hillel puts it, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? And if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Because here's the truth. The truth is, is that the most privileged among us have the luxury of being able to stand on the sidelines sometimes. This has always been the case in the struggle for justice, by the way. Martin Luther King said to white America that he wanted to draft them into the cause of racial justice. I want to draft you into the cause of racial justice, and a, and a whole lot of white America responded by forging a doctor's note in order to get a deferment. This was true in the days of abolition, by the way, the days before the Civil War. And if you go back and you read the history of even Unitarian churches in New England before the Civil War, you can find that, that, there were, that there were some who were very much in sympathy with the cause of abolition, and that there were a lot. There were a lot who said, uh, I'm going to forge a doctor's note to get out of this one. Here's the truth. The most privileged among us have the luxury of being able to stand on the sidelines. But here is another truth. Standing on the sidelines cannot and does not and will not save us. But engagement will, showing up will, moving into discomfort will. What really saves us? We are saved by getting proximate to the suffering and to the oppressed and the hurting of this world. We're saved by realizing that salvation must be collective, that it makes no sense to think about it in individualistic terms. We all have to get free together. And we're saved not by remaining on the sidelines when there is injustice, but by living what Forest Church calls a life worth dying for. On earth as it is in heaven. So may we make it that way on earth. Amen and blessed be. Freely have we received a gift that